Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our series of stories about Pensacola, North America's first place city. Today we begin a series of, of stories about the early American period when we became part of the United States. As a preface to that, of course, we have to remember that up until 1821, we had been, the all of Florida had been part of Spain. But in a series of, organ of activities that took place in the years 1817 and 18, a decision was made, a treaty was signed, and Florida was to become part of the USA. And the arrangement for that was to, to come in, a, in, of course, a very formal way. The selection of Andrew Jackson as the first territorial governor had been made, and early in July of that year, 1821, Mr. Jackson, along with his wife, three companies of infantry, and a band made the trek down the Mississippi River, then overland, and they set up camp about 15 miles north of Pensacola on the property of Don Manuel Gonzalez, who uh, Mr. Jackson had met and befriended some years before. Now, the protocol for this sort of thing was rather, rather strange. Uh, basically, the outgoing governor, the Spanish governor, was supposed to make a courtesy call on the incoming governor, Mr., uh, Mr. Jackson. Then Mr. Jackson was to repeat the call. At this time, and then at that time, of course, they would work out the actual details of how the flags would be exchanged and how the governor, governments themselves would be, be, be exchanged. Well, the, the, the story went like this. Mr. The governor of, of, of uh, the Spanish forces here at that time, the outgoing governor, was named Jose Cayaba. <clears throat> he was a little man. Uh, those who were, were around in the 1920s and 30s and uh, were movie fans may remember the, the, the actor Rudolph Valentino, a very handsome man with a little, little uh, tiny mustache, patent leather hair. He was the, uh, the, the ladies' hero. Well, that was Jose Cayaba. Uh, he was one of these people, apparently, who, who could sit strutting down, or rather could strut sitting down. And he, he did dislike the very image of Andrew Jackson because of the things Jackson had done here before. And so instead of going out to, uh, to uh, Gonzalez to meet uh, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Cuyava refused. And a day went by, four days, five days a week. At this point in time, Rachel, who was, uh, of course, uh, affected by the heat, the, the flies, the gnats, mosquitoes, finally said to her husband, look, you, you may continue to play these games all you want to. I'm going into the city, get myself an air-conditioned room at the Hilton or something like that, and um, you, you come when you're ready. So things proceeded another day or two, and finally Mr. Kayava did make the call. He made his call, Mr. Jackson went into the city, made his call, and the plan was made for the actual exchange of flags to begin at 10 o'clock on the 17th of July. And now picture yourself, if you will, in what we today call Plaza Ferdinand VII at, uh, along, uh, along South Palafox Street. And there in the very center of that plaza was, was a flagpole. And just before 10 o'clock, the entire city began to gather. Now, at this point in time, there were about 700 people in total in our city. This was, concludes everyone. This was blacks, whites, males, females, slaves, all the whole business. All 700 began to arrive. And promptly at uh, 10 o'clock, the two military groups assembled. The Spanish marched in from one side with a company, and they faced the, the flagpole. Then the Americans moved in on the opposite side, played, took to, uh, their position there. And then uh, uh, promptly, uh, on, on signal, Mr. Cayava came in from one side, Mr. Jackson from the other, and they were ready to actually begin the process. Now a, the drums rolled, and a Spanish star, sergeant stepped forward and drew down the Spanish flag. And you, at this time, the, the stories tell us that you could actually hear the, the cries and the moans of sadness among many of the women who were in the, in the audience because they saw their way, of, they believed they saw their way of life disappearing because there was nowhere else that they could go, on, at least basically on continental United States, where they would enjoy a Spanish or French culture. All right. Uh, promptly, the, f the first flag was down. Now an American sergeant stepped forward and raised the stars and stripes, making this part of the United States. And as he did so, the story goes that the little band that was with the American troops played the Star Spangled Banner. Now, I'm not sure that's true. It's published that way in two accounts that are historical, but we have to remember that Mr. S uh, Francis Scott Key had only written the, the words to this about six or seven years ago. 
And it would be another century before the Congress actually adopted that song as our national anthem. But nonetheless, we'll assume that the, the, the song was played and everyone uh, stood there just uh, enjoying the entire ceremony. And then Mr. Jackson stepped forward and he had two interpreters with him. A, one for Spanish language on his right side, or for French language on his other, because basically there were precious few people in that entire audience that uh, could understand English. And so Mr. Jackson began his process, and the very first thing he did was to welcome all of these people and to declare that as of this moment, they were citizens of the United States. All they had to do to, to confirm that process was at the end of the ceremony, to step over to a clerk who was at the right hand side of the uh, of the field and make their and sign the 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 uh, registration sheet or make their X if that was was uh, what they had to do but that's all it required of course you didn't have to do that if you didn't want to become a citizen that was all right too you could you could elect to, to uh, remain aside and perhaps do this later all right now he began to talk about what this meant what all of this meant to these people. He said, first of all, we have here, and he pulled out a paper from his pocket, he said, I have here a charter uh, confirmed by the United States Congress, a, a charter for the city of Pensacola. And it has attached to it eight ordinances, eight uh, ordinances by which a city council, a, a group of aldermen, will govern your city. And then he read off the list of aldermen. Now, these were all men who were prominent in the community. They were all well known to, the, to these people. They included George Boyd, John Kaiser, John Brosenham, John Inerarity. All of these men were well known and respected. And the, then Jackson went forward with, with the next statement. He said, now, these men are going to govern the city beginning now and until next April the 1st. And on April the 1st, you will hold an election. And at that time, you, you, the, all of the eligible male voters will either decide to retain these, the, these men or, uh, if they choose, they can elect uh, 10 new ones. Well, now, this, this started a buzz through the audience because at that point, probably not a single person in that entire audience had ever cast a ballot for anything. And they, they didn't quite understand that, but that, well, maybe that's all right. We, we can live with that sort of thing. And so he, then Mr. Jackson went on to, to one other item. Uh, I have to tell you this: that it's kind of a it's, a, it's kind of a humorous thing, really. The the when he came down from uh, from Washington, Mr. Jackson actually had with him only seven ordinances. And as, as he uh, uh, as he got to uh, as we got ready for the ceremony, he added the eighth on his own, and that was due to what his wife Rachel had done. You see, she had come into the city after her uh, after the discomfort out in the country, and she had stayed in the home of Dr. John Brosenham. And that was fine, except that uh, she had, was there on her own for two Sundays. And when, when she saw the way the local inhabitants observed the Sabbath, Rachel was scandalized because Rachel was a very religious woman. And she saw the, the people go to mass. And after they came out, there was gaming and shooting and gam all sorts of things. And Rachel thought this just this had to change. So she encouraged her husband to add that eighth ordinance, which would prescribe how people were supposed to behave on the uh, on Sunday. And I wish I could tell you right now that, that having that ordinance there made a great difference in the behavior of the people. Uh, I don't think that was probably true. Well, beyond that point, now Mr. Jackson turned to the second point, and he said, now I'm going to describe what's going to happen in terms of what we call county government. Now, you've not had that here for Spain or France, but now we, you're going, we're going to divide all of this territory from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the river all the way to the Florida Keys. We're going to divide it in half. And from here to the Sewanee River, we are going to call Escambia County. And from the river to the Keys, we're going to call St. John's County. Now, we are going to, I'm going to appoint, and here, of course, he had the list of three names. I'm going to appoint three men who are going to be the county commissioners for the Escambia County area. And their responsibilities, they have three. One is to build and maintain roads, bridges, and ferries. Now, as we all know, that was a considerable piece of real estate. And the, the, the task seemed tremendous. When, but it really wasn't to begin because at that point in time, there were no roads, bridges, or ferries. Everything that these men did at the urging of their, of the, uh, their constituents was going to be brand new. And so basically, we started out, we have county government established. Second, Mr. Mr. Jackson said, now we are going to have a territorial assembly, a territorial legislature. And for this, the Congress has appointed 13 men, and they come from all over the territory, some from people who live on plantations in central Florida, some are on the East Coast, we have some over here, and these 13 men are going to meet once a year, uh, probably about April the 1st, and they're going to alternate the meetings between Pensacola 
and St. Augustine. The next, the first of these meetings will be held in April of 1822. Now, jumping ahead on our story just a little bit, I'll have to tell you that the, the appointed men attempted to do just exactly what Mr. Jackson said, except that the travel from all of these remote places to Pensacola was very difficult. Uh, as they tried to assemble, uh, one of them was killed in a shipwreck, a second one was lost, but they finally did get here, and they had hardly reached the area when a yellow fever epidemic broke out. They had to retreat from one place to another to hold their meetings. And the, final, the, the, really, the only thing that they really uh, accomplished in that meeting was to decide that the original plan wasn't very good. This, this moving from Pensacola to St. Augustine just wasn't going to work. So they authorized two, two groups, one to move west out of St. Augustine, the other move east out of Pensacola. And, if, and when, where the two met, basically speaking, that was where the new state capital or territorial capital was going to be. And by happy chance, they met about where Tallahassee is today, and that is why we have Tallahassee as our state capital. All right, Mr. Jackson now, uh, having had all of this prescribed, uh, began to put together the various elements that we've just talked about. And Mr. Jackson was going, he would remain here for about 90 days. Now, we have to go back, of course, to what we, we, told, we talked about in an earlier episode. Mr. Jackson had accepted the job of governor because at the urging of his wife, he felt that having that role, he might be able to appoint some of the men who had worked with him as volunteers in previous marches into Florida and make, give them positions of some worth and kind of pay them back, if you will, for their previous service. But what he discovered quickly was when there was a major position to be filled uh, and he made the nomination for it, uh, President Monroe, just by happy chance, also always had someone from Virginia that well, he liked better. And so Mr. Jackson quickly discovered that he was not going to be able to fulfill that hope. And so uh, after just about three months, he decided his work was done and he chose to leave. Now, as he did this, we have to kind of take a, a little look at what Pensacola itself was like as all of this was taking place. There were about, about 700 people in the city, and in the total area that we talk about as uh, Scambia County, there was probably about 1,000, not counting the Native Americans because we have no idea how many there might have been of them. But nonetheless, the city was set together very much as Elias Durnford had laid it out as the English uh, surveyor some uh, almost 150 years before. Uh, we had uh, the blocks, the squares, and all that went with it, actually, basically much as we have in Pensacola today. Now, the city itself was not modern. Uh, its water supply, for example, was taken from two springs, basically two springs, plus, of course, individual family or, resident or business wells. There was a spring uh, opposite opposite present-day Gregory Street on the west side of town. That spring bubbled up and it formed what, we, what, what was a flowing stream which went right down into the Gulf. The spring was a very active one and that was the largest source of water that they had. That, of course, that's why we have Spring Street today. Then there was another spring right about where Palafox and Garden Streets came together. And that was, again, a public spring and then very carefully guarded by city ordinance. You, you were in deep trouble, of course, if you did anything that, that, that tampered with the water supply. A third spring that was not used too much because of its distance was right at the head of Bayou Chico. That was, the, that was, of course, the three elements of the, of the water system. The, the community had one fire engine that the Spanish had bought about 15 years before. It was the old-fashioned kind that you simply pumped. It was not a steam uh, fire engine. And, of course, their water supply for firefighting was, <clears throat> was very poor. At this point in time, there was a jail, the old Calabozo, which the Spanish had built, same building. And, the, uh, of course, the, one of the things that both the, uh, the county and the city would have was appointees of men called marshals. Today we would call them sheriff. And in each case, this county and the city had a marshal, and the, the county marshal also appointed posses who would help him in, in case of a law infraction. He could call a posse to work, and that posse would work with him until the, the problem was settled. He had no deputies, and of course the, the entire purpose was have a system of law enforcement, but keep the cost down. Beyond that, the city was pretty much as we see it today, and we'll talk about what some of the great land issues when we return with the next episode.